Hi guys, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to another video where today we're going to continue discussing the weaknesses of the bro Italy which is part of the rise of Mussolini and the establishment of a fascist state in Italy. If you have been following this series very closely guys, you will know that in the last couple of videos we discussed the long-term causes for the rise of fascism which are also the long-term weaknesses of liberal Italy. However, in this video we're going to be moving on to the short-term causes to the rise of fascism which are also the short-term weaknesses of liberal Italy as well. Uh, mainly all of the weaknesses uh, following uh, the end of the, of, the, of the First World War in 1918. Uh, I'll try to wrap up everything in this video, but because there are quite a bit of factors, I might need to break down the short-term causes into two videos, but I'll do my best to wrap it up uh, in this video so we can move on uh, to discussing more about how Mussolini himself contributed to his own rights to power. So without further ado, let's get started by discussing the short-term causes to the rise of fascism, uh, and also to continue taking a look at the liberal Italy, because it was a very important time in Italian history that truly set up the groundwork for the rise of fascism in the 1920s. So guys, if you recall to the end of our last video, you will remember that we wrapped up the video by discussing some of the main reasons why Italy decided to join the war in 1915 on the side of the Entente powers. And you will remember that perhaps the main reason for Italy's entrance was the hope that the country would achieve some significant financial and territorial gains. However, what Italy had to keep in mind is that these significant good gains that Italy had hoped to achieve were greatly relying on its good performance in war, meaning that Italy truly had to help out Britain and France if it had hoped to achieve the major gains it had hoped. However, Italy faced some great difficulties in war and in the conflict in general, which led to some very poor compensations uh, in the end following the Treaty of the South of 1919. So let's take a look at exactly what these difficulties in war were, and how they exactly uh, impacted the gains of Italy following the end of the war in 1918. Overall, Italy entered the First World War hoping to perform somewhat well in comparison to the great armies of Germany and the lesser great army of the Austria-Hungary Empire. However, this proved to be completely wrong and Italy's performance in war proved to be completely catastrophic. Italian campaigns like the Battle of Capoletto in 1917 uh, showcased some 500,000 Italian deaths and when you amount all of the major failures of Italy during the years of the war, Italian casualties amounted to around 1 million. It is true, however, that there were some instances in the war's history that Italy's performance proved to be very decisive. For example, the Italian victory in the Battle of Vittorio Veneto in 1918 was indeed something very positive for the Entente powers, given that Italy had fought Austria-Hungary and many historians have actually looked at this battle as being the precise battle that wiped the Austro-Hungarian army out of the war. And it was small victories like these that were very few, in fact, that made Italy hopeful that it actually received some of the uh, major gains that it had hoped to receive following the end of the war, which in hindsight we know did not exactly occur. And these difficulties in war directly link us to our next point that we're going to be discussing, which is the national humiliation that was widespread around Italy due to the poor performance in the conflict of the First World War. The nationwide humiliation that was spread all around Italy really took a toll on the population and on Italy's political leaders as well, greatly affecting Italian morale. And this was not just a product of the poor performance in conflict by the Italian army. It was also greatly a result of the poor compensations that Italy received in the 1919 Treaty of the South. To simply put it, the effects of the Great War in Italy were catastrophic, and at that time also placed great pressure on the Liberal government. So much so that in 1919, the Prime Minister of Italy, Vittorio Orlando, uh, resigned as he was overtaken with shame and could no longer be the face of the Italian government. But you might be asking yourself, what did Italy hope to achieve following the end of the war that it didn't? And why were the effects of war so catastrophic given that Italy actually came out on the winning end together with Britain and France? Well, this links us directly to the next factor that we're going to be discussing, which is the notion of the motivated victory. The motivated victory was this idea that was grappled onto by the fascists and greatly used during the 1920s during their rise to power, given that it was this idea that the fascists would constantly reference to turn the people against the liberal government and incite them to support fascism instead. So let's take a look at exactly what the motivated victory was. The general idea of the motivated victory suggests that although Italy had won the war, this had come at some significant cost to Italy and to the Italian population, to the extent that perhaps victory wasn't even worth it after all. 
Yes, it is true that Italy had received some sizable gains like Trentino and the Eastern Peninsula, but in all, the major pieces of compensation that Italy hoped to achieve, like the Adriatic port of Fiume, German colonies, and some significant financial compensation were nowhere to be seen. And the lack of these compensations would actually lead to some great, great problems during the 1920s besides the rise of fascism, as we're going to see in just a moment. For example, the Adriatic port of Fiume was a great piece of land that Italy had hoped to achieve, but when this did not occur following the Treaty of Assault in 1919, the infamous Fiume question came about in September of the same year. So let's take a look at the Fiume question more in depth. In essence, the Fiume question refers to the actions of the former war general Gabriello D'Annunzio, who actually took over the region of Fiume for 15 months, establishing his own government that was actually seemingly fascist, given that it was very violent and very nationalistic indeed. D'Annunzio took over the region of Fiume as he saw the outcome of the Treaty of Versailles as another knife in Italy's back. He took it upon himself to bring justice to the Italian people by claiming this territory that he thought was righteously theirs. D'Annunzio's actions greatly harmed the credibility of the Italian political system and of its government as well. He was effectively proving to the Italian people that direct, violent action was much more effective than the weak and often unpopular political system, which naturally made the Italian government seem very weak as the government failed to effectively deal uh, with D'Annunzio's illegitimate government in the region of Fiume. Alright guys, so this wraps up the section of the Fiume question of this video. And as you just saw, pretty much all of the weaknesses and factors that we've discussed thus far were a direct product of Italy's performance in the First World War, which actually trickled down as other weaknesses in other sections of Italian society, such as Italian morale, uh, the political system, and so on. But now let's move on to discuss some more uh, short-term weaknesses of liberal Italy, but let's discuss some that were not direct uh, causes of the First World War. Let's start off by discussing some of the political instability of Italy, starting off with a factor or a weakness that we would perhaps nowadays see as something quite positive uh, in life, but it was something rather negative for the political system in Italy and for Italians in general back then. And this was the fact that now, the political system had greater political representation. In 1912, the Italian Prime Minister at the time, Vittorio Orlando, passed universal male suffrage as an attempt to ease some of the tensions amongst the Italian population. He had hoped that by allowing people to vote and granting them the power of selecting their own representatives, people would engage in fewer disputes with each other. He was ultimately wrong, however, given that the precise opposite occurred as new ideologies entered the political scene, such as the great threat of communism, and disputes only grew worse. This set off a long period of political instability in Italy, something that would last until 1922 when Mussolini would rise to power. Smaller parties like the Socialist Party or the PSI, which we introduced a couple of videos back, and the newly formed PPI, the Catholic Party of Italy, uh, grew in size and in support quite massively over the years, whereas bigger parties that traditionally had a wider support base like the Conservatives or the Liberals saw a decline in their support base over the years and were no longer a majority. And as you can expect, this made governing very, very difficult. These formerly small parties now had wide support bases, which meant that they could acquire a significant number of seats in the Italian Chamber of Deputies, which was the Italian Parliament. Which basically meant that now, Parliament was made up of a variety of different conflicting ideologies, Catholicism, Socialism, Liberalism, Conservatism, all of which had different and opposing agendas, and all of which were sizable enough that they could prevent policies and ideas from actually being implemented in government, which is why the Italian government slowly became more and more ineffective. To give, to give you guys some pieces of evidence and an idea of how uh, bad the situation was at the time, in only four years, Italy saw six governments and four prime ministers, which just proves how politically unstable the country was. And this fact that we just discussed, the greater political representation, is actually a nice segue to the next weakness that we're going to discuss. As now, because these smaller parties were growing in support and becoming louder and louder in the political system, people started to be fearful of some specific ideologies. Uh, most famously, communism, of course. Over the years of the war, in which the liberal government proved to be very ineffective in governing and improving the situation for the Italian people, one party in specific grew massively in support. And as you can probably deduce, 
this was of course the PSI, the Socialist Party. And just to give you guys some perspective, this, the PSI had grown to such a uh, great length and to such a great extent that in 1920, it had encouraged over 1 million workers to engage in a general strike in Italy, something that was effectively done. And hence, the rise of the PSI started to incite a great fear of communism amongst the Italian people. Although the PSI was overwhelmingly a moderate party that supported moderate policies such as an eight-hour working day, uh, minimum wage, laws and general workers laws as well, the radical wing of the PSI was what sparked the true fear. As people saw these radical wings as the ones that were pledging allegiance to Lenin and the Comintern and attempting to establish a proletariat revolution or dictatorship in Italy. Which is why um, the rise of the PSI was also followed by the rise in anti-communism in Italy as well, which as you can probably foresee, laid the perfect groundwork for the rise of fascism later on, given that one of the direct things that that uh, fascism opposes and seeks to fight against is communism in itself. And like I said guys, the rise of socialism and of communism also incited the rise of the fascists. So let's take a look at how this exactly occurred. And just a quick disclaimer, as you're gonna see in a moment, yes, fascist is spelled without a T at this time uh, for distinctions that I'm gonna be making uh, in the remainder of this video. So uh, let me just get you the explanation so you guys can understand more clearly. Uh, due to their fear of communism, the government of Italy, and I mean the government itself, hired the fascists to combat communism. The fascists were a very violent, ultra-nationalistic paramilitary group in Italy. And uh, again, just to make this distinction, they don't have the T at the end of their name just now, because uh, when we put the T in the end, we're referring to the fascist party or the members of the fascist party. Uh, the fascists at this point are just the very ultra-nationalistic, paramilitary, uh, violent groups uh, that there were in Italy all around the country. And what is interesting to notice about the rise of these individual fascist groups is that they actually disagreed extensively on a variety of different fronts. And we're just binding it together by some key uh, common beliefs, such as the fact that all of them were anti-communist and pro-war, which is why they became very effective at fighting communism as they all fought under these very ideals. And by, by these few but very key ideals, the fascists became very good and effective in repressing communism just like the government wanted. In just half a year, the communist threat was effectively obliterated by the fascists, but they had become so powerful that they even formed their own militia, which would be called the Black Shirts. If you have studied Italy, you will know who the Black Shirts were effectively throughout the period of fascist Italy. But if you don't, just a brief explanation, the Black Shirts became this militia that Mussolini would make great use of throughout his authoritarian regime to establish order in Italy and maintain a powerful grip amongst the population. But anyways, like I said before, even though the threat of communism had effectively dialed down in just half a year, the fascists had grown extensively in power. They continued to persecute the left, uh, its supporters and leaders, and because of the extensive financing by the Italian government, the government had now effectively unleashed an unstoppable force in Italy, as the black shirts effectively took control of the Italian streets and would become very influential in Italian society, constantly undermining the liberal government as well. Alright guys, so this closes off the section on the fascists, uh, which is perhaps the first strong link to Mussolini and the fascist regime that we have looked at in these last couple of videos, but for now, this is all that we're going to be discussing in regards to them. However, I know that it is very interesting, so I'm going to be linking some resources about the fascists, uh, the individual paramilitary groups so you guys can have a further read about uh, and watch some videos as well as kind of a homework or preliminary uh, videos for when we discuss more of the fascists in our next videos as well. By gaining a good understanding of the fascists and exactly what they were, uh, you guys will be able to understand uh, our next couple of videos in a much, much clearer way. Especially because I don't really go in depth about the fascists as a group and as a force before Mussolini, uh, which is something that uh, I personally want to explore a little bit more, but it's just something that is not exa exactly uh, important for the history syllabus. So yeah, guys, I'll be linking some links down below if you want to take a free look at the fascists. Uh, and don't worry, I will be mentioning them in our future videos as well. And as I prepare for future videos, I might even include some more information than I already have. Um, but who knows, uh, we'll see. For now, however, let's move on to one of the last factors that we're gonna be discussing in this video, which are the short-term economic weakness of liberal Italy. Overall, guys, the major short-term economic weaknesses of liberal Italy were a direct consequence of the First World War, which placed huge economic pressure in Italy. 
I can't stress how bad the economic situation in Italy was at that time, guys. But to put it into perspective, pretty much all social economic classes took a hit during that time. The middle class was effectively devastated by an inflation of 50%. Uh, 50% is catastrophic guys, it's a terrible, terrible inflation rate that truly destroyed people's power of purchasing, uh, investments, and so on. Equally, the working class was extremely harmed as real wages, these are wages when corrected to inflation, fell up by around 25%, which is also a catastrophic drop. And all of this was worsening because of the increasing and widening national debt of the Italian government that by 1919 alone, sum to 85 billion liters due to wartime loans that Italy had gotten from the USA. These all had to be paid back naturally, which would incur some significant costs uh, and spending costs to the government as well, something that in the long term would uh, completely devastate uh, Italy, the Italian economy as well, as inflation would worsen as well, investor confidence would worsen, and many other consequences that I can't even name. And even businessmen and high classmen were extremely affected by the economic crisis, particularly because it came as a shock to the entirety of the Italian population. Mainly because during war, uh, government spending in wartime industries like steel, gun production, and coal was at an all-time high, which kept very lucrative contracts to a variety of different industries and firms as well. However, with the end of war, when the, over, when the excessive amount of these materials was no longer re uh, required, these contracts were all put into an end, and a lot of these firms and a lot of these industries went bankrupt as they were no longer being financed by the government. And the loss of these major businesses and industries incurred some significant economic, social, and political costs for the government as well. On an economic front, because these businesses and industries were no longer operating, uh, Italy's GDP would inevitably be affected as well. Uh, socially, however, these industries that frequently hired a significant number of people now just ceased to exist, which in turn would mean that unemployment would skyrocket. And on a political front as well, the impacts were very detrimental, mainly because nationalists and conservatives saw the end of these uh, traditional Italian industries as a major failure of the liberal government to, uh, to protect uh, true Italian patriots. Alright guys, so this goes off the section of the short-term economic weaknesses uh, of liberal Italy. So now let's move on to the last uh, factor and weakness that we're going to be uh, discussing, which is the rise of unemployment. I know I just mentioned the loss of Italian businesses as one of the main reasons for the rise of unemployment in Italy, but this was more of a long-term effect. Now let's discuss the short-term reasons for the rise of unemployment in Italy following the end of the war. Basically guys, the main reason for the rise in unemployment in Italy following the end of the Great War was the demobilization of troops, which left around 2.5 million men uh, unemployed, given that many went back home to return to their original job but many now could not because their jobs were taken up by uh, other people that had stayed in the country. However, the rise in unemployment was also a major result of the uh, economic situation at the time, given that firms were losing money and simply could not afford to hire any additional workers. And the impact of unemployment was extremely bad, especially when paired up with the effects of the shortages of food and the shortages of raw materials as well, which basically meant that people had no resources or money to survive and live a good life. So much so that the Italian quality of life greatly decreased at this time and people were pushed into some very uh, negative conditions. All right guys, so this brings us to the end of our video on the short-term weaknesses of liberal Italy, which are also the short-term causes for the rise of fascism. We have not, however, finished the rise of Mussolini just yet, so tune in to the next video where we're gonna be discussing effectively how Mussolini himself was able to rise to power under all of these conditions that we've been discussing on our last couple of videos. Uh, with that said guys, please make use of my notes that I've always been providing in this video. You can find the full document down below if you want to take a more visual look at the table and how everything is organized. And as I always say, these are my personal notes that I use in the IB, so uh, they're pretty good and I hope they help you as well, uh, especially when trying to digest the content in a more summarized format as well. With that said guys, please follow me on my Instagram at IBWithin as it always shows up. Uh, at the end of the video as there i'm frequently making updates and posts about the channel video summaries and so on so on as well uh, if you have any questions doubts or concerns you can always message me on the instagram uh, leaving comments down below or even email me at uh, I'd be with you at gmail.com, which is also linked down below, and I'll be more than glad to answer any of you guys' questions. Uh, with that said, guys, I'm gonna close off the video right here, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.